Hey, thanks for tuning in. We have Dr. Thomas Dragster here again, a, a world-renowned entomologist and scientist at large. He has done uh, massive amounts of work on insects, weeds, bricks of sugar content, and photosynthesis. And today we're going to talk about seed. Seeds. The seeds of change. Seeds of change. So if we're talking about a seed, you're talking about those small little reproductive structures that grow into a completely different plant, those seeds? He's brilliant. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure. Well, and, and there's a lot of talk about seed. There's a lot of money spent mm -hmm. on seed trials. Yes. And, and seed side by side. Yep. And let's talk primarily on soybean seed for just a little bit. And the reason I bring up soybean seed is we have a lot of growers that are calling in, emailing, texting, and they're wanting to go back to conventional seed. In other words, go back to a non-genetically modified seed. Mm -hmm. So when they say, well, we want to get back to plant conventional seed, my first question is, if you want to go back to planting conventional, what are you planting now? <laughs> Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? <laughs> <laughs> Would it be unconventional? Yeah. And they said, you're not really that funny. I said, okay, that's fair. No, stick with funny. I like funny. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like, say, if you want to improve your bottom line, not just bushels, not just yield. If you want to improve your profit, we can help you with that several different ways. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, now you're getting our, our attention. Say, how can you help us improve by going back to a non-genetically modified or conventional seed? I said, well, number one, I can just about guarantee will give you eight to 10 bushel jump when you go to back to conventional or non-GMO seed. And well, like, that sounds really good. Well, and that, that's what they said. And then it's like, how can you do that? How can you do that? Well, I can say that and we can do that because most of these guys have a really, really short memory. <laughs> You're <laughs> taking advantage of them now. <laughs> I got it. Okay. <laughs> and they forgot that when they switched to round up ready or a traded seed, there was an eight to 10 bushel yield drag. And when I mentioned that to them, they're like, son of a- This is a family show. We forgot about that. And so as we, as we start going on, we see number one, your seed will be less expensive. One, yep. Number two, we're gonna give Get, tell you how to use a little better nutrition to grow a healthier plant, you're going to get eight to 10 bushel back. And number three, there's usually a premium for selling a non GMO soybean. Yes. 50 cents, 75 cents. I've heard a buck, buck and a quarter in some places. Mm -hmm. On a scientific doctor level explanation, there's something we can all explain. Tell us a little bit about going from a genetically modified seed, good, bad, or indifferent, yeah. back to a conventional or a non-genetically modified seed. Fair question? Okay, fair question. Sure. The genetically modified seed, I've had a chance to measure a lot of these GMO soybeans, and generally speaking, there's always a range. It's never exact. It's not like I'm going to get up here and say, oh, yeah, it's going to be 4.6 bricks. But usually you're looking at a range of about three to five bricks for most of the GMO soybean. If you then measure, and I have some of the non-GMO soybeans, they can definitely be running somewhere between four or five at the lowest, uh, but they can hit as much as, as nine uh, from what I've seen. So there's going to be a, a, a fair range on them too. And this has to be how you are raising the soybean. The GMO soybean, it's very, very difficult to get it to break six, not impossible. So generally speaking, you're looking at a three to five. Whoa, 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 whoa. Brick, you're saying... I'm stopping again. 
I was on a roll, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's why I stopped you. Yeah. I'll see. <laughs> but you said something in the comment here. It says, it's hard to get a GMO soybean above six? It is. It is because you are dealing with a compromised seed. Okay, so from what we've talked about, what we know in the past, if mm -hmm. you can't get that GMO seed above six, are you ever going to have natural fungal resistance? No. Are you going to have natural insect resistance? Uh, some, but generally no. And are you really going to have natural sugar uh, production returning to the soil so you can reduce weed growth? The answer is not enough. Uh, because if you're not producing enough sugar on the plant, you can't exude through the root exudates enough sugar into, which means you're not going to have the microbes, if you're not going to have health. And if you're not going to have health, an unhealthy plant yields less, among other things. But even more importantly than that, we were talking about profits too. Well, well this is just a beautiful thing too, is that if you are dealing with a six, seven, eight bricks soybean, you don't need to spray for the soybean aphid anymore. Soybean aphid's gone by this point. And so the soybean aphid is prevalent on the GMO soybeans. It can be found on conventional soybeans. Don't get me wrong. If, if you're not doing a good job raising that soybean and you're dealing with a lower bricks plant, and if they are between three to five bricks, you are more likely to be attacked by the soybean aphid. The soybean aphid uh, is more or less gone by six <clears throat> Uh, and by seven, uh, we just really don't see it anymore. So you've now erased a particular insecticide that you may happen to be using against the soybean aphid. Well, the cost is going to be running anywhere between, let's say, $15 to $125 per pesticide per acre. And if you're dealing with a less expensive one running in the 15 to 50 range, then, uh, and if you're going to distribute it by plane, you're dealing with a, let's say, $50 to $65 application in order to take care, one application, in order to take care of the ubiquitous soybean aphid. When you have less inputs, you now make more of a profit, even if the yield is the same, even if the yield is the same. So we're dealing with can you raise it one bricks at a time? And if you do, you can start to erase the soybean aphid. You can start to erase fungus problems. Wait, but you just said that the GMO, it's very difficult to get above six. It is. And you're not going to have uh, resistance against aphids. I did say that, which means you're not going to be able to get that out. But there are ways to get around it, and that is, of course, what you were just talking about, using the conventional seeds, because this is where to, some of the farmers are moving right now. Go back to what some people say is a real seed. A real seed. Okay, a normal soybean seed. Real yeah. seed. Yeah. yeah. If we're dealing with that, uh, the soybean aphid only became a problem uh, once we introduced GMO soybeans, if you were not aware of that uh, uh, that uh, correlation that is there. The aphid in the soybeans was never a problem. Never a problem before. Yep. Coincidence? <laughs> you be the judge. <laughs> I'm sure it's just a coincidence. Wow. Yep. Soybean aphid only became a problem in the late 1990s. Now I know why they call you a disruptive doctor. That's a really mean thing to say. You're saying mean things you're, about me again. You're I'm going to start to cry. You're a problem to the flow of chemicals and high-tech things for farming. I have been told that before. I have been told that before. But remember what drives me and also drives you is you put the farmer first. When you put the farmer first... Uh, things start to change. You, you start to change your whole mentality of how crops are supposed to be raised when you're trying to help a farmer. And a lot of what I do and have done is to help the farmer. I haven't worked as hard in order to help particular industries of which we are talking about. And therefore, I may not be making the big bucks uh, when you are being supported by them. But if you are conscious of the farmer and that is who you serve, you then change your mentality about what needs to be done in order to help that farmer survive because the statistics are obvious. And the statistics say that farmers are going out of business at a very rapid rate. I would like to change that as far as I can in my, in my own little way. A lot of the information that you and I give are, are things and pieces and tidbits that we've picked up on our own. Mm -hmm. 
research and it's the right thing to do. You also do uh, group speaking and a I lot of, and a lot of it. You also do consulting. I do that too. Uh, a lot of your SAP testing knowledge and and history can uh, can start showing things on how to save and how to make money. Yes. Question: If a grower is concerned about some things, that's very general. I know. There's a lot of things growers are concerned about. <laughs> Plant health, soil health. If they were to send you or send your lab test results, SAP tests, tissue tests, petioles, mm -hmm. and they were considering to hire you for consulting, mm -hmm. how much good could you do with them in, say, a two- or three-hour time period? Uh if I had all of those tests that you mentioned, so I've got BRICS tests that they're conducting already. Mm -hmm. They've got data on tissue tests. You also said the petiole. The petiole is a little different than I'm used to doing, but I'm familiar uh, with the BRICS testing on the petiole too, and also a tissue test uh, because uh, it's a different part of the plant, and I realize it's a transit zone on the plant. And uh, then you've got, I could do plant sap tests as well. Uh, and what else did you mention? Soil tests? Yeah, if all that information is given to me, I will be able to tell you, certainly in a two or three hour consult, how much nutrition is in the soil, how much is getting into the plant, how the plant is responding to it, and if the plant is not responding to it, what some of the problems are. Uh, some of these problems are relatively easy to tell, relatively easy to tell. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got all the information, that's good. Sometimes I've just been given a soil test. And just like you, it's a little difficult. It's hard to characterize a farmer's land with just a soil test and nothing else. The more and information, the better. The more information, the better, because sometimes you'll just get a tissue test. And sometimes you're like, okay, well, that's telling me what the plant is doing, but it's not telling me uh, what the soil is doing. There could be some problems in the soil as to why this stuff is not getting up there. This is why I've always talked about bricks because it's inexpensive, easy for you to do. You don't have to send it off. It's not going to cost you a lot of money. And it gives you a lot of information that you need to know that helps bring light to the soil test. Mm -hmm. It brings light to the tissue test. It brings light to the plant sap tests. That's why I've advocated for bricks. I'm not a bricks only guy, but if you have other information and including the bricks, that tells me how healthy your plants are and what needs to be done or what the plants are doing possibly wrong. If they don't know their bricks, if they've done no sap testing, if mm -hmm. they've done no tissue testing, mm -hmm. is it relatively easy to help them? Uh, it is relatively because I can make suggestions about how they can be helped. So, yes, relatively easy. Okay, hypothetical. A typical farmer growing soybeans says, I'm planting genetically modified soybeans right now, and I want to I go organic. Mm -hmm. What kind of time frame are we looking at? Well, the time frame for me or the time frame from the organic, uh, obviously, if you want to get certified organic, the time frame is three years. Uh, I think most farmers are aware of that. But not necessarily the three years. Yeah, yeah. But the successful. The successful. Transforming to organic. Uh, three years is long. Three years is long. So can it sometimes take three years? Yes. Can it take two? Yes. And can it even take one? In some cases, yes. But... If you do not see perfection, and I know some farmers, especially if they've seen the videos, will think, well, right now I'm dealing with GMO soybean. Uh, I'm in between like three to four bricks, and I want to be able to get it up to 14 bricks by next season. Can you do that? The answer is generally no. You just can't go up from 14 if you've been doing that to your soil and your plants for you know, 5, 10, 15 years, 30 years, 40 years or more. You can't turn things around immediately. But you can show improvement. And improvement is easily measurable with bricks. Can you show improvement with the soil test? Not necessarily. Can you show improvement with a plant sap test? Not necessarily. Uh, I spent three years on that. How much can you prove it with a tissue test? Not necessarily. Because without all of the information, it's difficult to tell. We don't have any good standards 
to show. And we worked hard in order to try and get these standards for a soil test as to what's healthy and what's not. And there are differences in opinion all across the board, but there are no differences in bricks. Yeah. In bricks, this is what I always go back to, is you want to know, is it healthy or is it not? That's the first question you should be asking. And if it's not healthy, and oftentimes it's not, then we can start playing games. We can hit it with a penetrometer. We can hit it with an EC meter. We can hit it with some other tests and we can start getting some answers. But if you've got a healthy plant, it's coming in at 15.5 bricks. Dude, it's not GMO. <laughs> you're, you're not really dealing with any serious problems right now. And so I wouldn't worry about it too much. And this is going to be relatively easy, but that's not the case. What we've normally seen is, and we've helped a lot of growers and to transition back to conventional. Mm -hmm. And they're giggly when they see that eight to 10 bushel bump. They're giggly when they realize it's a less expensive seed. Less expensive seed, less expensive to grow. Yes. Yes. But the one thing we tell them, it's like, don't make any decisions until you know what your bricks are first. If there are two bricks on the soybeans that they're planting right now, and they switch to a conventional, mm -hmm. pucker up, hell will come and you'll get a beaten. Get the GMO seed as healthy as you can before you switch to the next one. That would be helpful. That would be helpful. That's what we've done. Yeah, yeah, that would be helpful. You can do that. Uh, of course, we've talked about the sugar in the past. Uh, that's very powerful to do even for the GMO because you will start to help the GMO incrementally. It's not like you're going to go up to 14 bricks if you throw on some sugar. Uh, but you'll be setting up the soil in order to receive the conventional uh, seed. However, having said that, you should also know uh, that I, I have known farmers before who you know decide to test this out and they'll put both on their field. And they see a visible difference yeah. between the GMO soybean and the conventional soybean. They see it, and that's on their field, which may be even toxic. It may be toxic based upon what they've been throwing on it for the past 10 plus years, but the regular GMO looks good. It may not be as high as it should be. It may only be coming at six or seven bricks, where it's gonna be higher than, than the GMO uh, soybean that we have, and therefore we know that we're dealing with a healthier mm -hmm. crop. So that can be done, and once they see that, when I talked to one guy about this, uh, he said, I cannot go back. You just can't. He says, I'm done. I will never use GMO soybean again. And I wasn't even hitting him that hard. Uh, I mean, he came out with this on his own. I thought, okay, well, he's converted right now. But that doesn't mean that he's done. Because now, if you have decided to move to conventional soybean, you still have work to do in order to get it up to the point where you don't have to spray for the soybean aphid, where you don't have to spray a fungicide anymore, where you don't have to deal with any uh, serious weed problems anymore, and uh, where you can actually even uh, produce enough nitrogen without using the MPK fertilizers. There are other sources uh, that are out there, especially if the price goes up again. Uh, yeah. As you know, some of you were puckering up when the NPK fertilizers went up to three times what it was before. I know it's come down a little bit since then, but that was that was a hard time. Yep. Uh, really yep. hard time. I hope we don't go through that uh, anytime soon again for the benefit of the farmer. Because yeah. we are thinking about the farmer. And I do want you to stay in business because, quite frankly, you're feeding my family. Thank you for doing so. <laughs> With that, for Dr. Dykstra and myself at Soilworks, we appreciate you watching and look forward to talking to you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.